All right, uh, David Herman for, uh, manages sports partnerships at Twitter. David, thank you so much for being here. David's all over the place. Where have you been this week, and where uh, are you going? <laughs> I've, I've been in New York, Chicago here, and Toronto uh, right after this for some NBA finals. So uh, it's a busy time of year, as always, but excited to be here. All right. Now, obviously, for everyone in the room, everyone's engaged in some way on Twitter when it comes to sharing their content, be it post-produced or live in some capacities. We'll break down a little bit of the advantages and the challenges of both, uh, but uh, David's obviously a fantastic resource because he gets to see and meet with a lot of people uh, to see how they're using the platform and then also provide some kind of insight into, hey, this is what we're doing on our end underneath the hood uh, to help you make content come together uh, and sing uh, you know, on a platform like Twitter. Uh, one of the first words that came out of Mr. John Wildhack's mouth was engagement. Uh, with content, that's obviously what sports on Twitter is all about. Um, so I guess let's kind of kick things off by really just diving into some really good content. As we mentioned, you get to meet with a lot of good people. Who are some, what's maybe an example to, or two that you've seen recently of good video content for video content creators here in the room uh, on your platform? Yeah, and, and thanks uh, for having me once again. Before I share some examples, I'm just going to run through like three or four slides that set the tone for how we think about all content on Twitter, whether that's video, whether that's tweet without a video, and everything in between. Uh, it'll help guide some of the examples uh, I'm going to show. So there we go. So first thing, Twitter is what's happening. If there's conversation going on in the world, it's usually being talked about on Twitter. And that conversational element is key to why our platform is different than many others. Um, and jumping into that conversation is uh, a theme you'll hear me talk about a couple times today. So there are a couple pieces of this. Um, it's fast. Uh, Twitter is usually where things start, um, and that's key to understand from a video perspective as well. I'll show some examples that are both really highly produced, but also iPhone videos, um, just because they're, you're able to get them out much quicker in the moment. So fast. Um, there we go. Personalized. Fans follow your account for a reason. Um, it's not, not the practice of our users to follow um, just uh, a million accounts, right? They are picking a curated timeline. Always think about that when you're creating video content because they're really following for you, uh, not for general consumption uh, of content. Uh, conversational, like I already talked about. We're a connected audience that drives discussion and we're open. Anyone can see a tweet, anytime, anywhere, any link. Um, you don't have a Twitter to be a private account. That's not how it works. You all know that. Um, so a couple examples I'm going to show that uh, tie into this. Um, and uh, these are, th there's a million great examples. These are three that I happen to like. Some super recent, some not as recent. Um, but I think we'll have sound here. So um, Ohio State football does fantastic job with video content. This was leading into the Rose Bowl. Just a fun, different way to um, play off the conversation of New Year's, of um, their game, uh, and uh, kind of leading into the bowl. We won't have sound on this, by the way. Oh, oh look at that. Look at hey. That. Thanks, team. Yeah. So uh, again, a lot of short video, um, punchy, quick sound, a lot of graphics, and we'll get into that in a bit. Next is um, UCF uh, does a fantastic job of jumping into the conversation. Obviously, a lot of conversation about um, CFP rankings and their path in. Um, this is one that I love and again is a perfect example of how to jump into conversation and uh, broach it head on uh, when, when you're involved in it. Um, love that. Uh, and then, you know, obviously there's the more cinematic kind of produced element of video that we think about and, and South Carolina I think does a great job of that. Um, as you can see, I also left the first tweet comment uh, up here. At least when we lose, we'll have this cool-ass video, excuse my language, uh, to look back on. Um, these comments are, are huge. Uh, we love when people call out video content, and it happens all the time. Um, sometimes these comments can go the other way, as you imagine. Uh, but um, 
it's a great, great video and example uh, of what we like to see on the platform. That's great. Uh, and you're ready to go on kind of my next question, which is, uh, uh, and you see this when you interact with a lot of uh, universities. We see it all the time. Every athletic department is structured a little bit differently. Who has the controls of a social media account may be different. Sometimes it's marketing. Sometimes it's within a content team. Um, sometimes it's SIDs managing individual team accounts. Uh, but for people who are just thinking about creating content wherever that may be going, what are some characteristics that you see in videos, kind of like with some of the examples we saw, videos that do well, I guess? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, the college space is incredibly complicated, as you all know, are more aware of than I am. Uh, every school operates differently, every coach operates differently, every athletic director operates differently, and there's so many nuances within that, who has access to what, when, and how much. Um, Taking all that aside for a second, and we'll get back into it, um, there's a couple things that we think are driving strong video content on Twitter. Um, now, it's not to say these are the only three best practices. These are three that we're noticing recently. Uh, making it short, uh, video that's less than 15 seconds is gonna generate the most engagement. Does that mean every video you post on Twitter should be less than 15 seconds? Absolutely not. But if your goal is to maximize engagement and sharing, the shorter, the better. Uh, and especially under that six second um, mark, um, we now have uh, looping video is, is on uh, all video under a, min under a minute now. Um, so it doesn't even have to be that short. But take advantage of the looping nature um, and, and shorter will keep folks uh, in there and attentive uh, throughout a, a little bit longer the video. Speaking without sound, um, it's no secret that, think about your own usage of Twitter when you're scrolling through the timeline. How often do you stop and actually click and go full screen in a video? It's not that much. We know that from research. Um, sound is actually not as important as you may think to the uh, kind of success of a video. With that being said, you do have to have cues within that video that replace sound to an extent. I'll show some examples in a second with graphics, and that's where that will come in. And, and be relevant. I talked about it before, um, but jumping into the conversation and what's happening is key. Uh, and be relevant also means um, when something happens, you have a win, take advantage of that moment. Fans are the most receptive on Twitter when something is happening, not three hours after an event. That's why if you have a great video on your phone, um, get it out. There's no, that's not stopping you from doing a more pre-produced uh, video later that has maybe more insight, more analysis, more whatever you, you want to, uh, whatever word you want to use there. But that video in the moment is really, really important um, on our platform. And I'll just run through three examples of these that I like. Um, so first, um, short. Uh, you know, celebration videos are a big thing. We see them all the time. Uh, you get the point very quickly. And I think a lot of schools do a great job. I think Clemson does uh, a really good job of taking advantage of these moments. You get all of, all of the feeling you need from this win, but this is a, you know, as you just saw, an incredibly short video. Um, I picked a non-college example here, but just because I think the Bears do a really, really good job of um, utilizing graphics in their video. This um, also uh, has sound. I'm going to play it without it just to drive the, the point across that, you know, replacing sound with graphics is incredibly important on Twitter. So you get all the information you need. Let's see if we'll play. There we go. Uh, oops. Let's see. Hold on. Go back to that one. Maybe, there we go. You get all the, all the information you need from the graphics here. You don't need any sound or any additional components of this video to know what they're talking about. And then joining the conversation, be what's happening. NFL had a luxury this year of having schedule release right around Game of Thrones. For those of you who don't know, Game of Thrones Twitter is crazy. It's, uh, uh, it's um, I think there were like nine million tweets about the finale or something crazy like that. Anyway, this was closer to the start of the season. Uh, but um, it's, a, it's a great example of the Falcons doing something really fun and creative around conversation that's going on uh, on Twitter. So um, playing off the Game of Thrones map for their schedule release. And as you can see, uh, 3 million views organically uh, on the platform as a result. Again, a lot of people are talking about Game of Thrones. If you're joining into that conversation, there are people who maybe don't follow you or don't even know who you are. Um, they're gonna, gonna find that content because of the link. Uh, and that's how to think about conversation on Twitter as well. 
Um, if you Google um, NFL schedule release Game of Thrones, Um, you'll find about 20 of these examples. I just happen to like the Falcons one. Let's see. There we go. <laughs> exactly. You're going to have to go on Twitter to see the exactly. rest. Um. Um, and, yeah, so that's a, a couple examples that I, I like, I think, demonstrate um, the best ways to use video on Twitter. Cool. This is kind of a, this wasn't in our prepped questions, but I'm just kind of curious about it because it's something I see a lot in the hashtag SM sports conversation that's out there that I'm sure you see a lot of. Um, interjecting yourself and your brand into moments like that, balanced with maybe the uh, unnecessary FOMO injection that might uh, occur. In what, are you having conversations with people on that at all? We're saying like, look, if it's relevant to your brand, great. If you force it, might not look so great. Uh, what, are, what are those kind of conversations that you're like, that you're having, whether it's with a college or, you know, pro team, you know, whatever, maybe? Yeah, it's always a battle, and every brand is going to have their own tolerance for what jumping into conversation means. I mean, let's use Wendy's as the extreme example. Not many accounts or many brands can have a brand voice like Wendy's. Uh, it wouldn't work for any of your schools. Uh, uh, that would be an assumption of mine, right? They're extremely bold and aggressive in how they uh, approach social. There's always a middle ground. I think we definitely see forcing and kind of jumping into conversation just for the sake of it when it's kind of at the tail end versus preparing for that. Uh, so it's the preparation versus reaction. Um, with that being said, I'm still a big fan of jumping into that conversation. If, if goals are to grow your account, reach more people, and drive more engagement, um, even if you're late on the game on those, you're going to get some reaction, right? And, and I think that's really important to think about um, through the process. But we do see uh, a lot of, I think, in the comment streams, of, uh, especially in the SM sports threads, you'll, you'll see all that chatter. But uh, I'm, if the content is good, I'm for it. Cool. I'm with you. Uh, any questions? I want to give you an opportunity to uh, ask David a couple questions if you guys have any. Uh, yes, we've got Bill. Mike's coming behind you, Bill. The video content uh, insights are, are fascinating and, and great for, I think, this entire room to learn. Um, what's your take on kind of rights issues? That's obviously been a big thing. Um, I'm no expert, but, but perhaps some of those things weren't rights friendly uh, for the platforms. Um, how, how can schools and, and how does Twitter as, a, as an entity handle that in terms of not wanting to stifle creativity, but at the same time not stealing intellectual property? Yep, and I'm going to skip ahead to a few slides because I expected this to come up. Um, <laughs> go forward a couple. Uh, there we go. Uh, it's very simple. Pretty simple. Uh, yeah. But also I will, I will add more, more color. This, the last few weeks has been aggressive, as many of you know, from a copyright uh, perspective. Um, we uh, follow what's called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DMCA policy, which allows users to post content onto our platform um, with the caveat that if the copyright owner does not want that content on Twitter, they have the full right to submit a complaint, and then we have to act on that complaint. Music is the, is the, big, the big thing here that occurs, um, and Universal, Sony, and others, uh, any record holder, has the right to enforce uh, that policy. I think the thing to think about is um, if you don't own the music in, in your content, you really shouldn't post it. It's going to get flagged at some point. Um, that's the simple answer. The not so simple answer is the nuances of that. Music in the background of stadiums. Um, let's use the Game of Thrones video. The reason that was okay is that's actually not the real Game of Thrones theme song. It's slightly different if you know Game of Thrones. Um, there are subtle nuances there. Um, I think it's just thinking smartly about, you know, if, if you're going to use something that's clearly not yours, um, that is obvious. Um, there are amazing services like APM, other third parties where you can buy, um, uh, you know, music uh, royalties that are really not that expensive. I also put this back to a different line, and I know it's not going to be the popular opinion, but music really doesn't have as much of an impact um, as we think it does on video, as we know it does on video, right? And taking that in mind and knowing that most video is consumed as you're scrolling in the timeline, because music as, isn't as important, um, I think we've gotten into this issue for, for uh, kind of uh, unnecessary reasons to some extent. So long story short, if you don't own it, don't use it. With that being said, 
we have a lot of work to do to make your job as, as publishers easier and the copyright policy is part of that. So we're going to be looking at what we can um, and um, whether that results in change, who knows. Um, but I think being careful, looking back at your Twitter accounts using Twitter advanced search, um, you can't scroll back in the timeline that far, but if you Google Twitter advanced search, you can put in your ad handle at date range and pull up tweets from whenever. Um, go back and remove things that you think may have copyrighted uh, material in them just to, to play it really, really uh, safe at the end of the day. Playing it safe is the best policy here um, because we do have to follow the law as it relates to this policy. Once it happens, there's not much we can do to help out. It's kind of out of our hands. Um, so definitely uh, keeping it safe uh, is better than sorry in this situation. Was there, a, can you give any insight? Uh, did, your, did your team have to react at all? Uh, and in what ways did you support Iowa, Iowa State, Rutgers, uh, yeah, some of the things that went down? And if that were to happen to someone in the room, what do you, what do you recommend they do? Uh, where you guys could help them out? We're always here to support, so uh, always can be in touch with folks when issues arise. I, I think there's two main things I would say. Make sure the email addresses on all of your accounts are active and they're email addresses that someone is checking. Um, Twitter support will email you when you receive a strike or if there's some other issue. Monitoring those email addresses is really, really important. Um, so monitoring email, Playing it safe, reaching out uh, will help when, when and if we can. Um, uh, but um, there's also, uh, it's going to be boring reading, but I suggest that if you Google Twitter copyright policy, it'll run through kind of what's allowed and what's not. It's just helpful to have as background information um, so you don't run into those issues. And then you have reading material for the yeah. flight home. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Yes, right here. Mike's coming up behind you. Hi. Um, some of the tips that you were talking about earlier, are there any subtle nuances that maybe appeal differently to mid-major schools who may not have as much manpower to create as much content as we would like? Yeah, absolutely. And, and we talked a little bit about this earlier. For me, the, the base, um, regardless of how many people or what equipment you're having, is the trust, relationship, and access with your coaches and student athletes. Um, Obviously, you can't be everywhere at once, but when you are in those moments, being able to have the access and have the trust from those staff to be able to get that content, whether it's just on an iPhone or something else, is the most important. So for me, um, it doesn't have to be at every single sport all the time, um, but when you are there covering an event, uh, you want to get your money's worth. That's what I like to think about it as. So for me, it starts with developing that trust, that relationship with the coaches and student athletes um, and administration to say, hey, when we're in position to do this, here's what we would like to capture. Here's what we would like to do. Um, so I think before you get to any of those best practices, that's the first step. Uh, and you can start to build off of those um, based off that access and that trust. Um, and if that's a, you know, a, a locker room celebration or whatever, uh, speech after a loss, whatever it may be, just having that access is the, is the first step. So, uh, and, and that can be done with one person, one iPhone, and, and nothing else. Um, I hope that answers your question a little bit. Got about five minutes. We can probably squeeze, squeeze in another one or two from the crowd if you got it. Okay, yes, in the back there, and then we'll, we'll come up here. Again, another... Oh, yeah, hello. Another, uh, like mid-major school kind of question. So, you know, obviously engagement is huge for us and we want, you know, as many followers, as many retweets, likes, all that stuff. But how can we turn, what's, what are some tips and suggestions to turn that into ticket sales, into, uh, you know, uh, merchandise purchasing? Because that, that's so key for us. You know, we don't just want traction on social media. We want that to turn into dollars, you know, for the school. Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. Um, the, there's, social media is a form of marketing, obviously, and you need to take advantage of that and hopefully convert, whether it's sales uh, on tickets or other things. I, I think it's, it starts with engaging content, as you mentioned. From there, you have a better chance of having someone to take an action. There are tools on Twitter that I really like for um, kind of driving to ticket sales or merchandise sales, um, and that's using Twitter cards. Um, they're kind of custom little elements that you can build out. Uh, if you Google um, or if you go to cards.twitter.com, I think is the direct link. Um, but that allows you to put a video with um, a very clear call to action kind of bar at the bottom that you know, lets users click into something to drive to a landing page, to drive to a web page, to then hopefully convert, right? So to me, it, it still starts with the content, 
utilizing tools like cards. Um, there's, an, uh, there's one called the video website card, which literally is a video playing when you click into it. Um, it just moves up and you have a mobile web page appear right below it. Um, people, uh, I know LSU does a great job with this tool and actually just um, lets you put in your email address right there and then sends information later. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to kind of reach and engage, but uh, it starts with getting that click and the way to get that click is by engaging content. Scott, you still have some? Just curious as a content creator, is, is there a significant engagement difference between video and a static graphic? Yeah, great question. And uh, I'll answer that in a couple of ways. The short answer is yes. We see videos are retweeted on Twitter about five times as much as anything static. Um, with that being said, there are nuances in, in how that content can perform and what type of engagement you're eliciting. So I think on Twitter there are three types of engagement. There's a simple like, um, there's the retweet quote tweet uh, option, and um, then there's commenting, joining in on the conversation. We see videos as the sharing mechanism. That's what people want to share and show others, whether that's with retweet or a quote tweet. Graphics and photos we tend to see as a like. Um, which to me makes sense, right? Think of your Instagram behavior and uh, a lot of other platforms. You're scrolling through, you want to recognize a great image or, or a great static, um, but there's not a whole lot to comment on or engage with. Um, GIFs and kind of other short form videos and content, if you want to loop, put that as a third bucket, that's what um, people are commenting on and joining in on the conversation. So um, short answer is yes, videos do increase that engagement, but there also can be some strategy in what type of engagement you're going for um, and how you want the content to help dictate that. All right, uh, yeah, we got time for one more. Let's, uh, let's take one over here. Put your hand up back again, so it's Rebecca right over there in the corner. You mentioned Twitter videos where you can just take it on your iPhone. What do you say to those creative people who are shooting on a really expensive, nice camera, getting almost the same, the same look, same feel? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think there's, a, there's always going to be a look and feel difference. Uh, and I think our users know that. Um, with an iPhone video or some real you know, POV focused item, like you're, you're in it. That doesn't mean you can't get that feeling from more pre-produced footage, but I think the, the, the thing that we like to, to note is that when you do have the resources, when you do have the ability to create high quality, good looking video, um, it's going to catch someone's eye, right? It's all about when you're scrolling through the timeline, what's gonna make someone stop and look? And there is no question, really high quality cinematic video will do that. Um, at the same time, it takes more time, uh, right? And it, if there's a, a moment that you just know is, is there and it's happening right now, that iPhone video may end up having more engagements or more views just because you're doing it in that moment, in that time. So I really do think there's place for both and I, I'm not um, kind of courting for one or the other, um, but I do think a strong video strategy incorporates a, a lot of that. Um, there are schools and folks who do high quality video turnarounds incredibly fast. It's, it's like magic to me, you guys probably not so much. Um, but if you have a setup with enough people to get you know, footage shared, edited, and, and out in, in almost real time, great, do that. Um, but um, obviously, that's hard to do at scale. All right, last question. Uh, this group, uh, oh sorry, Jess, did you have something? Yeah, all right, can we squeeze in one more here? Jessica Ramberg from the America East Conference. This space, social digital media, video content is always changing. I'm curious, David, how you and your team at Twitter Sports stay on top of that, relevant, and connect with it. Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's a great question. It's a lot of content all day long. There's no doubt about it, as you guys know as well. I, I think what we're looking at is specifically, how do the user behaviors of Twitter change? and how does content change as a result? We know, um, you know, I'll use a, an example, like we have live content and live games on Twitter, we haven't talked about a lot of, of live, but it isn't necessarily user behavior to come to Twitter and watch a full live event, right? Um, it's not as endemic to our platform. We've gotten creative in thinking about how do we 
how do we put live content on Twitter that makes sense for our users and the snackable pieces of content that they really want to digest? Digest. So our MLB partnership in live space right now is actually live snippets of a player's at bat throughout each game. It's a fan vote driven. You can vote at the beginning of the game. Who do you want to see at the, on the Twitter hitter camera today? And, and you're going to get that, cam that player's at bats live every day. Our NBA partnership was uh, a player ISO cam of second half of a game that was fan voted. Who do you want to see on Twitter tonight? It's more digestible content that fits user behavior a bit more. So I think when we look at content, we look, we look at how do we evaluate what's working, what's not, what's coming next. It starts with our user research and understanding what are our users actually doing on the platform, um, which still changes every day and still sometimes is uh, something that you know we need to do more research on to have a better understanding. Um, but uh, I hope that answers your question. But we, we really start with the user behavior to understand what works and what doesn't. And from there, identify accounts or videos or um, uh, partnerships that really fit those, uh, the mold uh, of our users. Um, obviously, every user is different, but there are trends we, we can associate. And, given how fast Twitter is, um, moving quickly is imperative. Um, so that's, that's what we see a little bit. I hope that answers. Uh, yeah. uh, real quickly, because we know you've got a flight to catch. Oh, you've got to cross a border and get into Canada uh, for the NBA Finals tonight. But uh, this group out here does not get a lot of downtime. Their off season, if that's even one that exists, is pretty short. Uh, they're doing lots of live production, uh, feature pieces, long form, short form, content for social media platforms. Uh, maybe they've got a couple weeks or a little bit of time here where they can do some actual hardcore assessing where they've been and planning for next year. Uh, is there any piece of advice that you can give them for the next couple weeks when maybe they have a little bit of time after baseball ends for some of them yeah. uh, where they can put themselves in maybe even a better position going into next year to succeed on Twitter? Yeah, I mean, uh, this, your, your guys' schedule are, uh, schedules are unbelievable. Um, it is nonstop, and you work at a, a pace that is truly amazing. Um, I, I think a couple of things. I'm a big fan of taking a step outside of your space. So uh, I, have a, I have a couple of Twitter accounts just because I follow too many partners and don't necessarily need that in my timeline all day long. Um, but I have one account that I use that basically you could think of it as a list that is all non-sports partners. Entertainment, news, food, um, culture, uh, anything you can imagine that's outside of sports. I think we all get so in our lane at times that it's really important to look at what's happening in content outside of our space. SM Sports is one thing. There's a whole other community of music Twitter, food Twitter, you name it. Um, it's happening from a content creation perspective in those communities too. Pick one that interests you. Dive into it a little bit. Follow new accounts. Look at what people are doing. Um, I really find benefit in that. And I think it um, also uh, will help you rethink a little bit of you know, what others are doing, what maybe we're not doing, and how we can stand out a bit. Um, sports especially tend to, everyone tends to stay in their lane a little bit, even when pivoting. Um, and uh, taking a, a look outside of that, I think, is really important. So uh, not that you need more content while you're on your break, if you have a break. Um, but I, I do think, uh, because it is the only time to do it, um, taking a step outside, following some new accounts, some new communities, will uh, open your eyes to what other great content creators uh, are doing outside of the sports space. Right. This has been some really fantastic insights. David, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, really guys. Appreciate it.